Continuing in the narrative of the Holy War, remember last time we saw Prince Emmanuel clearly declare that Mansoul is rightfully his, and in that he will conquer Diabolus and make Mansoul his home. We began with Emmanuel having the white flag flown on Mount Gracious to announce his grace to them upon them turning, and also so that they would have no excuse uh, if, if he destroyed them, you know, in case they rebelled. You know, he, he, he flew the white flag. They knew that grace uh, would be there upon their submission to him, so they wouldn't have any excuse if he did destroy them upon their continuing to rebel. But then he also commanded the red flag of Captain Judgment to be flown on Mount Justice. So the white flag was flown on Mount Gracious. The red flag was flown on Mount Justice. And that flag was just as well to show the city that they are under judgment for their rebellion to him. But when the town remained as unconcerned as before, not worried about any flag that he flew up or, or him even being there and giving him no reply, he sent a message to the town explaining his intentions in flying the two flags and to find out if they would choose mercy or judgment. And this was where the city expressed in obedience to the law of Diabolus, their king, that they would not give him an answer uh, either way, it, for mercy or judgment, they wouldn't give him an answer. But they, they would request that Diabolus himself give him whatever answer he saw to be in their best interest. So, you know, we're not going to answer you, but we'll let Diabolus come answer for us, and, and he'll make, obviously, he'll make the best decision as our king for us. We mentioned just the, the warped mind uh, of the sinner in even in the face of Jesus Christ, to still follow uh, the way of rebellion and to follow the evil one in whom the whole world lies in the power of, as 1 John five nineteen declares. And at first, Diabolus in this was uh, rightfully so afraid of Prince Emmanuel, and he didn't want to meet with him. He refused and huffed around at first, but he finally agreed to go to Mouthgate to give the reply that he thought was best. And you remember he essentially questioned the prince on why he would come to take what was, you know, obviously rightfully his. For Diabolus conquered the city and, and the city submitted themselves to him and they opened their gates to him and they have sworn loyalty to him as their king. Uh, they further given him their castle and put their army under his command, all while disowning Prince Emmanuel and King Shaddai. So the city's done all this. Hey, why are you coming to try to take my city? I'm, I'm obviously... The, the rightful owner now. They've given me all this command and so forth. Uh, Mansoul has accepted his law, his name, and his image. So Emmanuel really should just leave him to be with his own property. But as we stated in, in the beginning, Emmanuel clearly declared that Mansoul was rightfully his. And he began doing this in response to Diabolus by firstly stating that the only reason he has control over Mansoul is through pure deception and lies. The only reason it's his to begin with is because, I mean, he never acted in truth. He never rightfully took it. He took it through deception and lies. Uh, Prince Emmanuel stated, you have a pretend right, but the entrance you claim you had at their gates was by lies. You slandered my father and his law. You deceived the people of Mansoul. Now you pretend that they have accepted you as their king, but this was all done by deception. If lying and tricking and hypocrisy will be accepted in my father's court, then you may have lawfully conquered Mansoul, but what devil would not conquer like this? You conquered them by promising them happiness in their sins when you knew by your own experience that this would destroy them. And that was just amongst some of what Emmanuel had to say to him uh, in, in that respect. And so Mansoul is by no means Diabolus's. Uh, though the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, that doesn't mean that the evil one, that doesn't mean that Satan actually owns the earth and all that is in it. That is the Lord. The, 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 the Lord owns the fullness of the earth. He is the one who created all things and they are his. Though, though it lies in the power of the evil one, it's not his rightful possession. And, and furthermore, you can simply say that man's soul is not his because our Lord and God's uh, ownership of his creation is not up for vote. Right? It, he created it, as I just said. It's his. He never gave mankind the decision, hey, you get to say who's your owner. You get to say who has ownership over you. It's not up for debate. It doesn't matter what we say. We can try to, you know, throw off his cords of sovereignty, try to, try to burst them uh, apart from us, just as it says in Psalms 2. 
but he who sits in the heavens laughs. He set his king on Zion. Uh, his sovereign plans will move forward. We don't frustrate his plans. He frustrates ours. So it's not up for debate. It really doesn't matter what man's soul decides to do. Our God didn't give man that authority where he is, whether we like it or not. And because of that, we will always be his. And thus man's soul will always be Prince Emmanuel's and King Shaddai's. And so we ended with Emmanuel then stating four reasons, you remember, for why man's soul will always be rightfully his. Uh, firstly, speaking of creation, his father established the town and built the castle for his own pleasure. Right? So it's God's creation. He created the heavens and the earth and all within it. It's his by, uh, it's his, his by right and title as creator. Uh, second, you remember it's Prince Emmanuel's as well as he is the heir of his father. All that is the Father's is His as well. Uh, that's John 16, 15, verbatim. That's what the Lord Jesus said. All that the Father has is mine, is what He says. And as the writer of Hebrews states in chapter 1, verse 2, the Father has appointed the Son as heir of all things. So just very clear. The Son is the heir of all things. Thirdly, it is Prince Emmanuel's, Mansoul is, because His Father gave it to Him. His father gave him Mansoul. Uh, the father loves the son, John 3, 35, and has given all things into his hand. Father loves the son, he's devoted to his son, and he's given all things into his hand, including a people, including Mansouls to redeem. And fourthly, it is Prince Emmanuel's by right of purchase. Um, he gave his life for his elect Mansoul, and, and it is his. He went to the cross to purchase his mantle. It's his by right of purchase. He came down to do the will of the Father, and the Father's will was that he would lose nothing of all that he had given him, but that he would raise it up on the last day. John 6, verse 38 to 39. And that he secured, that he would uh, not lose them, that he would raise them up on the last day, that he secured on the cross. Uh, where he purchased the church, he purchased his people by his own blood. That's what the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 28, where he exhorts them to care for the church of God that he obtained by his own blood. And so uh, the prince has come, as he expressed further to Diabolus, by command of his father to take what is his. But as he then went to compel and exhort Mansoul to repent and to turn to him and live, we close with them continuing to not listen to him at all. For they barricaded your gate, they set a guard at it, and they commanded that none of the townspeople should leave the town or that anyone from the prince's camp should be admitted. So uh, no lies out, no truth in, essentially is what's going on there. Barricading the ear gate, not even listening to your very own creator, your very own God, when he's there right before you, as surely that is what mankind did when our Lord, our great God and Savior, became flesh and dwelt among us. They didn't want to accept him. They wanted to kill him. They didn't want anything to do with him because he testified of their words that they were evil. So we continue to see that in man's soul. And so in that, in that train of thought, this evening we begin to see Emmanuel's battle to conquer man's soul uh, begin. We see the beginning of the battle. And from this, what we are going to majority-wise touch on and see this, theme, this scene through is through the biblical truth that regeneration must precede faith, that we've, we've, we've definitely covered um, the understanding that God must do a work in us first before we rightly come to him. I thought another aspect that scripture gives us in this is uh, the understanding of, of being born again, that you must be born again to rightly see our God in truth, and, and regeneration must precede faith. And so we're going to cover some of those truths and, and, and see those truths through, through this scene. Uh, the truth that a sinner must be born again to then rightly submit to and place their trust in Christ, and not vice versa. So certainly in much of the church contemporary today, much of the, the modern professing church today, and being really man-centered, they would teach that we must believe in Jesus to then be born again. That, that we, we both agree that you must be born again, we, just, we, we disagree biblically on when that takes place. Much of the contemporary church would teach that you must believe in Jesus Christ first, and then you are born again. Uh, but the great problem with that, and, and really this is along with, as I said, what we've seen and mentioned several times through this book, is the, is the inability to come to God in truth on our own. 
We don't have the ability to come to truth or come to God in truth on our own. And thus, apart from the new birth and God graciously changing our heart and mind, we'll never want to or, or desire to believe in Jesus. And that's exactly why uh, Emmanuel must come and conquer Mansoul, because Mansoul isn't going to submit to Emmanuel on its own. He must come and conquer it and bring it to submission to him. Uh, just to give some further biblical perspective on that and being born again, our, our Lord taught this truth very clearly when speaking to Nicodemus, where in John chapter 3, verse 3, he stated, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Meaning, apart from this new birth, you don't have the spiritual eyes to see God's kingdom. God's kingdom is amongst us. God's kingdom is growing. But if, you don't, if, you, if you're not a receiver of this new birth, you can't see that. You can't see the kingdom. So, essentially, apart from the new birth, you don't have the spiritual eyes to see and receive things of truth. And this is just another way of expressing many truths, as I've already said, that we've expressed throughout this study. Uh, that in and of ourselves we are fallen sinners, we're dead in our trespasses, we don't seek for God, but we seek a way that feels and seems right to us in accordance with the passions of our sinful bodies and minds. And apart from God and Christ first doing a work in us, we will remain that way to receive his justice and hell. So as rebels under the lordship of Christ, we have the responsibility to repent. All mankind is commanded by God, Acts 17 I believe it's verse 31, but it's, if it's not, it's around there. But all mankind, under the lordship of Christ, under the lordship of God who owns the heavens and the earth, uh, and us as his creations, we, we are all commanded to repent. We have a responsibility to do that, to obey his command and repent. But apart from his electing saving grace to enable us to do that, we never will. We will not obey. Apart from him mercifully granting us the ability to do that, we won't obey. We've mentioned John 6, several times. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one has the ability to do that. And just the same, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they first be born again. Now, that word again there in John chapter 3 in the Greek can also mean from above. Uh, depending upon the context, the word means from above several times in Scripture. Uh, one example is in James 1, 17. The very same word that's used again there, or, or that's translated as again there in John 3, 3, is translated as from above. As every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. That's the very same word there in John 3, uh, verse 3, that's translated again. Um, and understanding that, you can see that in the context in John, the word can really have both meanings there. It can mean that you must be born again and that you must be born from above. Because not only is it a new birth of being born again, but it is a birth from above. Uh, it, it's a birth that comes down from heaven. It comes from our God. Uh, it doesn't come from this world or this creation. It comes exclusively from our God in heaven. He must first come to us and change our hearts and minds before we'll ever see and submit to him rightly. And so along with this as well, church, when it comes to who is born again and who isn't, we don't get to make that decision. We don't make the decision of who is born again and who isn't. That decision is purely upon our sovereign God to make towards his chosen, towards his elect. We all deserve hell and his justice for our sin. So it is a great grace and a great mercy that he even chooses to save anyone. It's, a great, it's an unfathomable love that he chooses to grant anyone at all the new birth. None of us deserve the new birth and salvation whatsoever. But to the praise of his glorious grace and granting sinful rebels that which they do not deserve, he chooses to grant some the new birth and converting them and drawing them to believe upon the Lord Jesus. Right, as John says in John 1, verse 11 to 13, the Lord Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him, but to those who did receive him, who believed upon his name, he gave the right to become, uh, to become children of God who were born uh, not, uh, not of the will of the flesh, not of blood, uh, not, or not of the will of man, but of God. I think I mixed those three up, but nevertheless, it is those things. It, it is not of our own will. It's not of the will of others. It's not because of our own ethnicity, uh, but it is of God's will that we are born again. Why are we born? Because of the will of God, because of the desire of God to do so. 
And thus we only rightly believe upon Christ and follow him because of that gracious work that he chooses to do within us. Uh, a work, well, as Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work, he began it. A work he chose to begin. A work that we would never deserve and a work that we would never want apart from him changing our hearts. Church, the fact that we don't make this choice as well to be born again, the fact that we don't choose our second birth is also true of our first birth as well, which is one of the reasons I believe our Lord uses that analogy to begin with. Uh, it's interesting. It was, I think it was two Lord's Days ago when we were talking to Don, who's visited the past couple uh, Sundays. He, he mentioned this, this reasoning. Uh, but it, but it, it goes very well with this understanding of being born. Just ask yourself, what role did you have in your first birth apart from simply being the one who was born? Did you choose to be born the first time? Were you active in that? Did you, you know, I think I'd like to be born now. Did you make that choice? Were you a, did, did you choose to be born and then you were born the first time? Did you by your own will choose that? Well, of course you didn't. And, and right along with the analogy of birth, it's the same with your new birth as well, the second birth. If you be born again this evening, just as a baby cries uh, after they are born, beloved, you only rightly cried out to the Lord in truth after being born again by his sovereign grace. Being born of the Spirit with life from above uh, into God's family. He began the work in you, which is a work of his grace, that he will continue to the end. As the Apostle Paul states in Titus chapter 3, beloved, for the true saints this evening, if you're truly in Christ, born again this evening, in Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to 6, for we ourselves, or for you yourself, uh, you were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, you were enslaved to various passions and pleasures. Uh, you were passing your days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That, that could sum up the life of the unbeliever. Foolish, disobedient, led astray, enslaved to various passions and pleasures, uh, just acting like a beast towards our God. Passing days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Verse 4, but... But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. It wasn't because he looked down and said, oh man, that Trenton is such a good guy. I need him on the team. Huh? Amen. I mean, it wasn't because of that. Right, amen. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't, it wasn't because Nathan was either. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it wasn't because any of us were. Um, it was not of works done by us in righteousness. We didn't have any. We didn't have any at all. But what was it from? But according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, and regeneration is just another biblical term that means to be born again. It, it means the exact same thing. If you're regenerated or generated again, you are brought into being again. You're basically created again. That's what it means to be generated again, regenerated, generated again. You are born again, uh, which, again, must precede or come before faith. Regeneration must precede faith biblically. And as I stated before, we see that truth as we continue our narrative for this evening, not only in the continued foolishness of man's soul shown in rejecting the prince to his face, but also in seeing the fact that Emmanuel must conquer man's soul for it to be brought to submission to him to begin with. Because, as I've said before, apart from that, uh, man's soul will not submit. He must conquer. So, Bunyan tells us that when Emmanuel saw that man's soul was so involved in sin and despised his words, he commanded his army to be ready for the appointed time. Now, since there was no lawful way to take the town except through the gates... Right, so, that, I mean, it, it must be taken not, not by uh, physical force, but it must be through the gates of the senses. He commanded his captains to bring their rams, slings, and men and to station them at Eargate. After his troops were in position, Emmanuel sent another message to find out if the town would yield in a peaceful way or make him use severe means. The people, with Diabolus their king, called a council of war and agreed on terms that would be offered to Emmanuel. And so you see, they're, they're still in this 
In coming to a council of war and agreeing on terms that would be offered to Emmanuel with the obelisk, they're still seeking to submit to him on their own sinful and selfish terms. They're still enslaved to their own sinful passions and pleasures, and in that state of mind, they will not seek to come to their God in truth. And so Bunyan continues to tell us, and I'm just I'm going to read this part, uh, that they... They chose an old Diabolonian in the town named Mr. Loath to Stoop. Mr. Loath to Stoop, or uh, Mr. You know, I hate to submit, basically. And they sent Mr. Loath to Stoop, and they sent him with their reply. He arrived at the camp of Emmanuel and addressed the prince, Great sir, so that all people may know what a good-natured king my master is, he has sent me to tell your lordship that instead of war, he is very willing to turn over one half of the town. Uh, I've been sent to learn if your lordship will accept this proposition. So you see, it's still just foolish and ridiculous thing. Oh, he'll give you half of the town. Then Emmanuel said, The whole town is mine, both by gift and by purchase. Right? They've already went over this. And because of this, I will never lose one half. Continued foolishness. Then Mr. Lowe to Stoop answered, Sir, uh, my master has said that he will be content that you would be the nominal or by name only. Nominal, and I don't even know how, how you pronounce this, titular? T-I-T-U-L-A-R? Titular? 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 It means by title, I'm assuming. Nominal and titular, lord of all the town, if he could rule just a part. Right? So, hey, you can be the Lord by name, and I'll just rule a little bit of it. More sinful and just foolish request. Emmanuel replied, the whole town is mine in reality, not in name and word only. Because of this, I will be the sole possessor of Mansoul, or none at all. Then Mr. Lowe to Stoop said again, Sir, see the condescension of my master. He says that he will be content if he may just have some place in Mansoul assigned to him, where he may live privately, and you shall be Lord of all the rest. But the prince said, all that the father gives me shall come to me. And of all that he gives me, I will lose nothing, no, not a hair. I will not grant him even the smallest corner of Mansoul. I will have it all to myself. Mr. Lotus Stoop said again, Oh, but sir, suppose that my king gives the whole town to you with this one condition, that when he sometimes travels this way, that he can stay in the town for a few days or a month or so. But may this be granted. You know, I could come and stay... Uh, Diabolus could come and stay for, for a little bit, for a time. Then Emmanuel said, No, that is contrary to my father's will. All Diabolonians that shall at any time be found in Mansoul shall not only lose their liberty, but also their lives. Mr. Lotus Stoop asked again, But sir, if my master gives all to you, can he maintain some kind of old friendship with Mansoul? Perhaps by letters and news uh, from travelers and unexpected opportunities and the like. He just wants any little place he can have. He, he, he wants uh, Mansoul somehow to not be in full submission to their creator and Lord. Emmanuel answered, no, by no means. Any fellowship, friendship, or acquaintance in whatever way will corrupt Mansoul and turn their affection from me and endanger their peace with my father. Mr. Lotus Stoop added, oh, but great sir, since my master has many friends and dear relatives in Mansoul, may he give them some tokens of his love and kindness when he leaves. Then when he is gone, they can remember the good times they once had with their king when they all lived together. But rightly understood, they had no good times. You've had no good times in rebellion to God. No good times at all. Amen. Amen. Emmanuel replied, No, for if Mansoul is mine, I shall not allow the least shred of Diabolus to be left behind for Mansoul to remember the horrible communion that was between them. Well, sir, said Mr. Lowe to Stu. I have one more proposal, and then I am finished. Suppose after my master is gone that some in the town would have urgent business and that he could be best be of service to them. May he be sent for? And if he cannot come into the town, could he meet them in a nearby village to discuss the matters? This was the last of the ensnaring propositions of Mr. Lowe to Stu. That, that, that's, that's essentially coming against the sufficiency of Scripture. The obelisk has nothing to tell us that would be of good service at all. Our king's given us all things in his word. His word is truth. His word gives us all things for life and godliness. I'm never going to need to go outside of that. 
Emmanuel would not grant this, for he said, There can be no matter that could occur in man's soul that could be not solved by my father. It would be a great discredit and disgrace to my father's wisdom and skill to allow anyone from man's soul to go to Diabolus for advice when they are told that in everything by prayer and supplication to let their requests be made known to my father. Further, if this would be granted, it would open a door for Diabolus and his Diabolonians and Mansoul to hatch a plot to destroy the town to the grief of my father and me. You could, you could put that in that sufficiency of scripture thing. It's a sign for, for choices. After hearing Emmanuel's answer, Mr. Lowe to Stoop returned to report to his master. He told Diabolus that when he had left Mansoul, Emmanuel would not allow him to have any communication with the town. And from this, Bunyan then tells us that Diabolus and Mansoul then agreed together. So Mansoul and Diabolus come together and they agree together to do their best to keep Emmanuel out of the town. And they further sent Ilpaz to tell the prince and his captains from the top of Eargate that they are resolved to stand and fall together and that it is useless for Prince Emmanuel to think of ever having Mansoul as his, uh, as his own unless he can take it by force. Don't even think about it unless you can take it by force. Which is, as we've already discussed, why we must be born again. Uh, we must have our heart changed and renewed first by our God and Savior before we'll ever submit to him rightly as such. So, you know, interestingly enough here, they, they, they came from two totally different starting points. Uh, though in Mansoul's sinfulness, they're, they're coming to this from a totally different perspective. They actually just spoke a true statement here from Old Bill Paz. Uh, that's actually true, what they just said. Uh, because it is useless for Emmanuel to think of ever having Mansoul as his own unless he can take it by force. He does take it. He, he changes the heart sovereignly uh, by his force, by his grace. He does so. Because apart from that, just as us, Mansoul is resolved not to submit nor seek him as Lord. We must be born again. Our hearts and minds must be conquered by the King of Kings. And so in light of that, Bunyan tells us that as Emmanuel was told what Ilpaz said, he said in reply, I must use my sword. I must use my sword. For no matter how Mansoul rebels and rejects me, I will not quit my siege. I will surely deliver Mansoul from the power of their enemy. You see what grace that is. What grace, what mercy, what... What love unthinkable that is. Uh, for while we were still sinners and rebels, wanting nothing to do with him whatsoever, church, Christ laid down his life for us. He died for us while we still hated him, while we were still in rebellion to him. And on the basis of that, we have been brought from death to life with him, saved by the matchless grace of God. It's amazing. No matter how man's soul rebels and rejects me, I will not quit, is what he says. They're going to be mine. I purpose for them to be mine. They will be mine. It doesn't matter what they do. They're not going to frustrate my plans. My love will conquer their sin. I will complete this work that I've chosen to begin. What love? That is the love we're to have for one another, beloved. That's how they'll know that we're his disciples, John 13. Loving one another as he has loved us. A love that is not wavering. A love... That is unfrustratable. Furthermore, Emmanuel then commanded the captains, the first four, bow and arrogance, conviction, judgment, execution, to march with their troops immediately up to Eargate. They were to sound their trumpets, fly their flags, and shout for battle. The prince also commanded Captain Credence with his men to join them at Eargate, and Captains Good Hope and Charity to position their troops in front of the high gate. The rest of his captains and their troops were ordered to advantageous positions around the town, and they went to battle for Mansoul. Bunyan tells us that several of the officers of Diabolus were killed in this battle. Some of the townsmen were wounded. Of those captains who were killed were Captain Boasting, Captain Secure, Captain Bragman, and Captain... Love no good. Also, he tells us a Mr. Feeling was wounded in the eye and almost was killed by bow and arrow just though he got away, while Ilpaz as well was badly wounded in the head. 
while Wilby Will was also wounded in the leg. And when they saw that Eargate and Eygate had been damaged and could have been breached and that some of their captains were dead, the city was overcome with fear. They had felt the force of the shot fired over the wall by the golden slings of the prince into the middle of Mansell. And then after the battle, the prince commanded, you continue to see this grace shown, after this, this specific battle, the prince commanded that the white flag be raised again on Mount Gracious to show that he still had grace for the wretched town. He, he wasn't there to just destroy it. He was there for grace. He was there to deliver them from Diabolus. And then upon Diabolus seeing the white flag flying again and knowing it was not for him, he himself devised another plan. He thought he could persuade uh, Emmanuel to allow him to reform Mansell. I'm going to read that part as well. So one evening, a good while after the sun had gone down, Diabolus called to speak with Emmanuel, who met with him at the gate. Diabolus spoke, Since you have flown your white flag, it must be assumed that you want peace and quiet. And I thought you would want to know that we are ready to come to an agreement on terms. I know that holiness pleases you and that you like devotion. I know that your purpose in entering into war with Mansoul is to make it a holy place. Well, withdraw your troops, and I will make Mansoul bow to you. First, I will stop all hostile acts against you. I will be willing to become your deputy and serve you with as much loyalty as I have fought against you. I will persuade Mansoul to receive you as their lord, and I know they will do so immediately when they learn that I and your deputy. I will show them how they have erred and that transgression stands in the way to life. I will show them the holy law which they have broken and to which they must conform. I will impress upon them the necessity of reformation according to your law and to be certain that none of these steps fail. I myself at my own expense will set up and maintain a sufficient ministry including lectures in Mansell. Then to prove our subjection to you we will pay a yearly tax that you consider reasonable. Emmanuel said to him, How full of deceit, how fickle are your ways. You have changed and changed again so that you could keep control of Mansoul, although it has been plainly proven that I am the rightful heir. You have already made several proposals, and this is not a bit better than the others. Since you were unable to deceive when you showed yourself in black, you now transform yourself into an angel of light and behave like a minister of righteousness. <coughs> But Diabolus, you know that nothing you propose should even be considered, for you do nothing but deceive. You have neither thoughts of God nor love for the town of Mansoul. From where can these offers possibly come except your sinful craftiness and deception? The one who can propose whatever he pleases, even if it destroys those he claims to love, must be disregarded along with what he says. Besides, if righteousness is so beautiful now, how is it that you only wanted wickedness before? Ah, but that is insignificant at this moment. You talk about reformation and Mansell, and if I allow, you will be the leader of it. You talk all the while knowing that the greatest ability the people have to keep my father's law and his righteousness will do nothing to remove the curse from Mansell. Mansell broke the law and came under the curse of God, and they can never deliver themselves by trying to obey the law. That is to say nothing of the kind of reformation likely to be set up if the devil was to become the corrector of evil. You know that everything you have said is a hoax, and just like at the beginning, this is your last card to play. Many are quick to learn your ways when you show them your cloven hoofs. But in your white and light and transformation, only a few see you. But you will not do this to my mansoul, Diabolus, for I still love my mansoul. Besides, I have not come to give my mansoul works to live by. If I had done so, then I would be like you. But I have come that by me and by what I have done, mansoul may, may be reconciled to my father. This will be so even though they have provoked him by their sin and even though they cannot obtain mercy by keeping the law. You talk of making this town do good when no one wants you to do this. My father has sent me to rule and to guide this town by the skillfulness of my hands into conformity to him. So I will possess man's soul for myself and I will throw you out. I will set up my own rule and I will govern them by new laws, new officers, new motives and new ways. I will pull down this town and build it again, and it will be as though it had never been. 
it shall be, Mansoul shall be the glory of the whole universe. And certainly it will be. It will be the glory of the whole universe because of who Christ is sufficiently for his people. Because of who, as Prince Emmanuel said, who he will be for his people and how he will guide them and what he leads them to. But you see what Diabolus brings out here is still the kind of nonsense that the unconverted, rebellious heart of man will come up with and not seeking really to submit to God. All right. They'll seek to, to become good enough themselves. They'll seek to do it all themselves. It sounds very religious. It sounds very uh, Christian-y. You can, you can still use Jesus' name and so forth, but really it's, just, it's all about you and what you're doing to earn your way and make yourself right. And it's not all about God and what he has sufficiently done in Christ Jesus and his glory. They'll get right themselves. When the thing is, just as Prince Emmanuel said, you can't. You can't get right yourselves. You can't make yourself right with God by keeping the law. You sin. You deserve hell. As Emmanuel said, we cannot deliver ourselves by trying to be law keepers. That's because we already deserve his justice and being law breakers. We've already broken his law. So on our own, there is no way we can uphold. On our own, there's no, no way we can satisfy the justice we deserve. Then... Uh, in, or in keeping the law that we've broken. Justice must be served, and if not on you, then one must take your place. Justice must, God is the just judge of all the earth who will do right. He will judge all of creation. And if, and if justice does not come upon you, it must come upon another. Justice is going to come. Uh, he, he's not like these unjust judges in the land... He's not like false gods that come from the imaginations of man who who just take justice away and pretend like you never did, did a thing and just forgive you. Justice will come. And the only sufficient one to take your justice before our God, the only one qualified to do that and ordained to do that uh, by the Father is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. It is the man, Christ Jesus. He's the only mediator. He's the only one that, that brings together holy, sinless, perfect God and sinful, wicked man. He's the only one that brings the two together. He's the only one in whom salvation is found. He who lived the life his people could never live, died the death we all deserve, and rose again from the dead for our utter salvation and reconciliation to God. That we would be reconciled and transformed into new creations and given new hearts and minds that love Christ and love his law and want to obey his commands, want to obey his law, not to earn favor with him, but, but because favor has already come in Christ. And he's enabled us to do that. We uphold the law through the gospel, as Paul says. I believe that's Romans 3, 30-something. Beloved, you must entrust yourself to Christ alone and be made right with God. And then from that, your life will be reformed. From that, your life will be changed to be holy as you ought. Whoever abides in me, King Jesus says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Who's the one that bears much fruit? Whoever abides in Christ and he in him. He it is that bears much fruit. And listen to this. The Lord Jesus says, this is John 15, 5, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, nothing beneficial, nothing of, 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 of any real worth in God's creation, nothing for the kingdom, nothing in truth. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Beloved, you cannot make your life right to then be right with God. That is a lie from the others. That is a lie from Satan. It, it may be a, uh, for our sinful minds, it may be a plausible sounding lie, he may come to us as Diabolus did, as Emmanuel mentioned of Diabolus, uh, you know, clothed as a minister of righteousness and, and seeming to be an angel of light. Hey, if you can be righteous and you can be right with God, it may sound right to our sinful mind, but it's further sinful pride and it's further wickedness and rebellion to God who commands us to repent and to believe the gospel. It is only in being right with God in Christ that our life will then be made right by his grace and for his glory. And so just as I stated in beginning, in this foolishness of Mansoul and Emmanuel's endeavor to conquer the city, 
what we see is just the clear truth. We mentioned this before, but this evening we mentioned it in that we must be born again. We must be made new by our God in Christ Jesus or we'll never seek to submit to him in truth. But we will wiggle and we will squirm and we will try to maneuver around as much as we can to try to make ourselves better on our own because we're really just all about us. We're, we're, we're very selfish, we're prideful, we're enslaved to various passions and desires and we want to follow a way that seems right to us and that's what we'll do. We'll wiggle and squirm to try to make ourselves better on our own trying to find another way all the while, there is no other way, and we rebel against that way, and we rebel against our Creator. And thus, if you're not in Christ this evening, by His grace, stop the foolishness, stop the pride, stop the rebellion, repent, believe the gospel, and trust yourself to Him. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Uh, you will be made new, a, a new creation in Christ, where the old has passed away, and, and the new has come. Uh, you will have confidence that He who began a good work in you will complete it. Uh, that you have been born again and seeing the truth, and that he will continue to, uh, to work in your heart and mind for his good pleasure, uh, both to will and to work, to live out his truth, and to do so with his church, because if you've been reconciled to God, you've also been reconciled to his people. We're here to encourage one another and build one another up in the truth and, and work out our salvation together in fear and trembling. And trust yourself to Christ. Uh, because in and of yourself, you'll, ne you'll never be good enough. Uh, and that's the good news of the gospel. There is one who is, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll never be good enough. He must conquer you. And trust yourself to Christ while God has given you time. And that is all we'll cover this evening. And Lord willing, next week we will see Emmanuel the victor uh, conquer Mansell. We'll see uh, victory for Emmanuel. We'll see Man uh, Mansell conquered. We'll see... Diabolus thrown out and so forth. Uh, Lord willing, we'll see that next week. And apart from any comments or questions, we can uh, begin our little review.